Hey, everyone. Welcome to Alpaca Finance's 32nd Fireside Chat. As always, what we'll do is run through the, the top news in you know crypto and DeFi, potentially NFTs and gaming over the past couple of weeks. And then we'll roll into questions. So this is questions coming from people listening right now. So if you are on the Twitter app on mobile, you click the, the mic in the bottom left-hand corner and we'll bring you up. In the Q&A section. And we'll also take alpaca bank questions coming from the community over the last couple of weeks, selected by our mods and, and core team members. I think it's it's worthwhile, you know, this, this is still ongoing, as everyone probably knows. And the, the FTX saga is something that we will see for a while to come. But for anyone that's, you know, in the markets or watching the markets, it is worthwhile, I think, mapping and looking at you know, potential continued contagion in the market. So I think that the first news that broke quite quickly actually was was BlockFi based on like the structure of their revolving credit line with with FTX. Genesis is still ongoing to an extent as well. You have DCG, but just this week we saw Orthogonal Trading, which is a you know, like a, a trading firm based out of the the states i believe that first impact a maple pool so they were seemed to be acting continuing operations even though they were insolvent and they've been borrowing from from a maple pool uh through m11 so there's that there's also amber rumors as well so a lot of these market makers may have had you know double digit percentage of liquidity of their liquidity on exchanges and i think it's still really yet to be seen like the full contagion from this particularly firms that were using under collateralized lending protocols like Maple or, or Clearpool. You also had um, Oros as well that missing payments. And there is a really great resource. I know, I know Sam sort of shared it internally yesterday of all the different firms from investors through to sort of acquisitions that kind of fit under like the FTX umbrella and potentially all of the the impacts there. So you're talking, it's a huge amount of exposure. Some are calling it a non-trivial amount. Some have come out and you know said that 50%, like uh, Galio's capital, like 50% of their assets were on FTX, and it's still very unclear what the path is particularly for maybe U.S. clients, if they are so, if there is liquidity in the FTX U.S. regulated entity, or it's all been wiped out. So it's something to basically, I think, mark for everyone, because maybe in DeFi, it's less impactful in terms of the protocols you use. But a lot of C5 players, a lot of market makers, trading firms, venture capital, all had exposure primarily through you know capital on ftx so i i don't think this is done yet but sam what, what are you seeing on your end in terms of like potential risk and contagion going forward if this isn't resolved quickly there's still a lot right and the resource that pete mentioned is it's essentially a chart that maps out all of the non-public potential exposure companies that are exposed funds and if you join our Discord, you can find that in the DeFi Buzz channel. So like looking at it is very interesting, right? Because what we've seen before is like a list of all of the companies that Alameda invested in, which is fairly public. It's just their their portfolio, but it's hard to say which of those companies are actually affected. They would typically be affected by losing the funds that they had with uh, market making for Alameda, which is typically not going to be a fatal loss for a lot of the companies. So their big thing would be if they were using, for whatever reason, they kept their treasuries with Alameda, right? So we, we don't know what percentage specifically that was. I've seen some numbers of Solana companies, like around 30% that were directly affected by FTX. Directly affected is going to mainly include treasury loss or partial treasury loss, something along those lines. But those are really just the relatively smaller players. CRM already folded, right? So the big ones are the market makers, the ones that are cross-chain or not really chain-related at all, but providing the infrastructure of what's making DeFi and crypto run, right? So companies like Jump, which is one of the biggest players in the space, they've been suspiciously quiet for a, a, a long time. 
since this happened, right? And they were very, very confident and aggressive in what they did. If anyone remembers, there was the Solana wormhole hack that lost hundreds of millions of dollars and Jump decided to step in with their own funds to directly cover that hole, right? Having said that, I don't know if they actually sent those funds or if that was just like a, a PR stunt, but they won't be doing that anytime soon. And they're certainly very likely exposed to some regard. And there's been rumors of them selling on the market, selling off assets gradually. So this is going to be a slow fold out unless we, we see some more cascading type of major players fold. Certainly the big one we've spoken about before is, is Genesis and the GBTC product, of course, which is all connected. Looking at how that worked and sort of the financial games that they've been playing, it's it's hard to say that everything connected to that won't go down as soon as one of them goes down. It, it seems like they're moving dead around from one hand to the other, and there's just a lot of exposure there. But that one will probably be a very slow type of process if it does happen. Like I, I don't expect to see anything from that until the middle of next year, Q2 at the earliest. But in the meantime, we don't really know what the timeline is for finding out what is the the final contagion here because all of these companies are private and they just don't share information. And it, it sort of feels like a bunch of guys in the firing line and everyone's just hoping that the firing squad runs out of bullets before it gets to them and they're all just keeping very quiet so that they don't draw attention, right? But if you look at the sheet that I shared, there's definitely dozens of companies, major, major companies, market makers, top funds that are affected by this and even potentially centralized exchanges, right? So sexes at the moment have a sort of Damocles on their heads. If they do not provide proof of reserves, then at some point, Unless people completely forget about this, which is not impossible, but I think difficult, you know, people are going to get very suspicious of of why they haven't done that yet. So that's what we're waiting for from sexes. But we do have definitely millions, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of exposure across various companies, Coinbase, Huobi and DeFi companies, Layer Zero. The smaller ones of those, the tens of millions aren't necessarily going to cause a a huge loss on some of these companies. But when you talk about some of them losing 10% of their trading capital, 10% of their assets, that really could be fatal. If you combine that with, did they take losses in the market as well? Is that number actually accurate, right? Because we don't know again. So it's still going to be some time until we the final shakeout. Typically, I expect markets to not rise at the very end of the year. Because you have people selling assets, whether the markets are good or bad. If it's good, you have people taking profits so that they can show a profitable year. If it's bad, you have institutions. But people, too, uh, tax loss harvesting so that they can take losses. So either way, it's uh, sell pressure. So there is going to be some pressure on these companies uh, in order to provide finality to close out any kind of holes any kind of open books that they still have and really be able to provide updates to their investors and to any entities that they are obligated to. So the end of the year is really what we're waiting for. But even after that, it might take some time when some of these could potentially fold from investor withdrawals, right? So a lot of investors who invest in hedge funds, in in any kinds of funds to manage their capital, they're not probably not checking it on a daily basis, right? A lot of them might check it quarterly or even yearly. So we're going to see the end of year returns from some of these potentially not look quite great. And you will definitely see some investor withdrawals, which can make some more of these folds. So we'll see. I still expect this to take at least a a few months if nothing else happens. But yeah, there were definitely some huge losses. One that kind of stands out to me in terms of the investors and FTX umbrella is the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which is really the only one here that seems like a retail focused type of uh, institution. Pete, what is it with an Ontario that got them to stick their neck out here? I don't know, but they got burned twice, both on Celsius and FTX. So I think that's their, I imagine, last foray into crypto for a long time. So Ontario's Teachers Pension Plan is exactly what it sounds like. It's the, the body that manages 
all of the you know billions and billions of dollars of capital for pensions for for teachers in Ontario, right? And they got burnt. I can't remember how much, but by Celsius was one, and then FTX is the next one. It's obviously that was the first, I guess, foray of a pension fund that I could see into crypto. Obviously, they do other, I'm sure, software investments alongside others. But a lot of these big, like SoftBank, and I know the Tiger Global has got absolutely wrecked this year. They lost to the tune of, I think it's $42 billion, which accounts for $158 million every single trading day. And in 2022, which is mad, but you're, you're seeing this across the board. You're seeing like with, I think it's BlackRock, they've basically halted redemptions, basically like their REIT fund. Blackstone. Blackstone. Yeah, 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 yeah. BlackRock, Blackrock, that would be a lot scarier. Yeah, yeah. So Blackstone, sorry. Yeah, Blackstone has halted redemptions given it's something like the threshold is, I think, 4% or 5% redemptions every quarter. But there's a huge redemptions in TradFi as well. So it's not particularly looking that hot across the board. But yeah, the Ontario's Teachers Pension Plan is the type of, call it fun, that you know a lot of these you know tech firms or crypto firms, like regulated ones, you know, really want to tap up because it is sort of like the a huge, huge pot of money. And then after that is sort of like sovereign funds. But that is definitely not going to continue in the future. But I think another one, which maybe Sam, you've seen more of this is like DeFi insurance. I know I know Nexus has had a fair amount of like negative news come up. I haven't been following it too closely. But maybe you have. So Nexus Mutual is the biggest insurance company on Ethereum originally that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. And then there are other ones that have spun off insurances. I think it's the second biggest one at the moment, but these also took losses. So recently, uh, I don't know exactly what their totals are. I, I've known insurances took big losses on Terra because they had a UST peg protection. So we all know how that went. And then Nexus recently took some losses from the FTX fallout. And there might be more as companies continue folding, you know, these kinds of insurances are, are going to be pressed. So we'll see what happens with that. Their model is kind of interesting, right? So it's like, essentially, you can call it a P2P model where you are staking in the DeFi insurance platform in exchange for providing the coverage and you get the APY. So this is the take on how to do DeFi insurance in a decentralized manner. And we'll see at the end of the year, really, like what kind of return that provides. I guess so far, it hasn't been too bad for them. But the APY isn't particularly huge either. So this le really leads us into the question of like DeFi models that work and ones that are still experimental, ones that are probably not going to have long term sustainability. So insurance is one of the interesting industries, obviously one of the biggest industries in the world in traditional markets, but really has been hard to figure out in DeFi and crypto in general. The big issue for us, Alpacas actually has insurance coverage from Nexus and Insurace. So it's something that we worked on last year. And the big issue in insurance is just the lack of liquidity, right? So at that time, when we were talking to them, we had a billion dollars in TVL and the amount of cover, I should say. You actually can't say coverage within the context of insurance due to some legal stipulations. But the amount of cover that was available was you know, tens of millions, maybe $100 million max on the platform, on the entire platform, right? So there's no way for us as an entity to be able to get insurance. I know Pete actually spoke with major traditional insurance companies that were considering stepping into crypto or did step into crypto a little bit. And the type of rates that they were offering was like 5%, uh, maybe 3% for typically, you know, for lending pools where the APY wasn't much higher than that at the time. So just really unaffordable uh, if you're dealing with a, a traditional agency, because for them, they're pricing in really like risk for a tech industry that they don't understand at that kind of price. So it's a good question. I haven't seen really a, a winning solution yet. I think that there is merits to P2P insurance. It does seem to work at a small scale, but the scale isn't big enough to do anything. So it, it's really just a P2P scale where you can 
as a user can potentially analyze if you want insurance on a certain strategy. And that can work if you're getting double digit percentages APY on the strategy for that period of time and the insurance is less than 5%, right? So maybe that makes sense for you. But at the same time, then you have to go through the process of getting your cover paid out if there is an event. And on the one hand, so how that works, it's basically a governance process. And and we've seen that governance processes at some other companies have kind of panned out in a not so very pretty way, right? So we've seen some debacles in DeFi where cover or payouts were promised and then essentially just went back on. We've seen guys come like whales come in and just take over entire votes and governance is fallible in its current state. And there aren't a lot of protections against things working like they do. I think in the case of an insurance company where they understand that if they play around with not covering when they should be, that their entire like user base will pretty much disappear because it'll be considered a sham at that point. So it, it's less of an issue, but it, it is still an issue because there isn't really a great model for this kind of, of governance, you know, and, and especially if you don't have a strong team that really cares beyond personal interests in order to maintain a, a certain proper stance on the co- side of the company and on the team in order to do the right thing. And a lot of the time you don't know if you do <laughs> until you get tested. And most of the time they kind of get shaken out or they take the money and run like some big names have done. So insurance is still one of those areas that can be innovated on. Hasn't really seen that much innovation, but I wouldn't be surprised if something pops up like sort of the uh, GMX of insurance at some point and, and it just works, right? Yeah, Pete, what do you think about other DeFi models that work or clearly are not working? Probably easier to talk about what's not working at the moment. Nexus's uh, coverage for what they're calling custodians, which is FTX, Binance, Coinbase, and Kraken, which obviously comes down, you know, proofs in the pudding. Most of it's around hacks, which you could argue that FTX was hacked, which, you know, if they had four million bucks of coverage, out it goes. I think the major issue, and we'll take under collateralized land like the Maples or Clear Pools of the world as an example, is that it's quite difficult to get over some to what these counterparties are doing. I guess it's the same in like the traditional finance world where um, it's very, very similar, but people were putting capital into maple pools or clear pool pools and they were given to like leading market makers or say delta neutral funds or similar and i think the general assumption was sort of like well not that they're too big to fail but there's no way that there can be this type of like contagion and sort of drawdowns in the market therefore the the model should work and i know they try to wrap around sort of credit worthiness, which I think probably when they open the pool could be correct. But, you know, as we saw, the second largest exchange was potentially cooking the books and had, you know, co-mingling of, of assets and issues. And none of that will crop up. If you are a bad actor and doing these things, then all the data is fudge, so it doesn't work. So anything around like credit or under collateralized lending, I think at this point is very difficult. I know some people were looking at, okay, if, if a wallet's had a, let's say like a year long track record of paying back their loans and borrowing money, therefore they should be do some sort of credit. But there's so many ways to fudge the systems, particularly with a wallet where, you know, that could potentially be sold and purchased and then something could happen when that person's taking credit. So I think under collateralized lending at this point is going to be a very, very difficult sell going forward just because of like the monumental blowups and sort of the cascading effects of this. Like, you know, Maple had, I guess, M11, one of their pools was managing basically their delegates. They manage the pool and who they give a loan to. So they're meant to, you know, vet like an orthogonal trading and keep an eye on what they're doing. And obviously that doesn't work. So I think those models generally... I'm sure there will be, as you said, you know, Sam, there will be like a style model that comes out that just maybe will work for everybody. But in its current initial phase, then I, I would call it a, a failed experiment. And I know there's been, you know, huge criticism of Nexus, particularly on well, that's an insurance model that has been around for a while and likely can be, you know, worked on. But I think those at the moment are ones in particular that 
will need to be revamped to make an impact on the market. In its current form, I think the confidence is, is mostly done. Yeah, as long as they don't get hit too bad and just like make the insurance providers LPs suffer, I think that they'll stick around until a, a better model comes around in insurance. And the same for under collateral thing as well. So until we see... I don't think we're there yet, but until we really see a Maple Finance or another one like that get hit for double digit percentage losses within a year, which is obviously going to cover anything that they would have made during that time, we're not really going to see that segment of the industry really get crushed. But it's a really interesting type of thing, right? Because was it like in the beginning of this year that Maple really got big? And at that time, everyone in institutional DeFi was talking about it. I know, Pete, you were having conversations, right? Everyone was mentioning this. They were like, hey, are you going to do something like this? There were some major, major market makers coming to us and talking about doing a joint venture for opening our own Maple Finance. And it seemed to be they were kind of treating it like a money tree or like an infinite liquidity source without really considering the controls and the risk management, right? And there's two problems with just the entire model itself. The one problem is that because it's such a new industry, because these are new companies, because there's no regulatory frameworks, no oversight on the people that they're lending to, you don't know what the hell is going on with your money, right? So uh, just imagine being a user of these platforms because, again, they take funds, right? It's not like they're their own money. They're inviting you as a user to basically lend there in exchange for a higher percentage of APY for loans. Don't get paid back. Your money just goes poof. So the reason that they do that is because they work with the big brand names who are the borrowers. But the problem is that those brand names, one of the marquee names was Alameda, right? So two problems. One problem you don't know what's going on with your money uh, behind closed doors. Once it, it goes to an Alameda, you have no idea what is what their balance sheet actually looks like. And the second problem is that even if that was regulated, even if they were based in the States and, and you could have some reasonable accuracy, that they're not just completely fudging their books. When you're dealing with derivatives, there are ways to fudge books that still fall under regulatory compliance. So they can use derivatives to hide losses, to hide debt in in lots of ways. And anyone will have a really difficult time to make sense of what's going on based on the structures and like the house of cards that they can create with derivatives. So all in all, it's extremely difficult and risky to do this kind of lending to these entities. And you still have these markets going and we're seeing more and more news on the, every week about some sort of like one of these borrowers that is failing to make repayments or just completely going underwater. And I do expect to see more losses coming in gradually into these markets. At some point, I suspect that it will become a sustainable industry akin to, you know, like under collateralized loans in reality. But even then, it's not really you have to have like a very tight knit relationship. And uh, all in all, I think the DeFi lending is just clearly a much better model. And it doesn't allow these borrowers to completely go degen and just take out infinite capital, post the same collateral on multiple loans like 3AC did, which is completely criminal and you know just insane. So, you know, I think under collateralized lending is probably not going to be very strong within DeFi for like, I think it's going to get significantly weakened from these events. I think it'll stick around, but it's not going to be one of the things that is talked about a lot like it has been this year. But if we really return to the main question here, so what are models that work? I think it's clear and it was clear before even this cycle that like, you go back to the old idiom of if there's a gold rush, you don't want to be the person digging for gold. You want to be the person selling shovels. So in the first infrastructure is, is really like one of the, the best areas to be involved in. If you're building the blockchain, if you're building the necessary infrastructure for five companies or crypto companies to function on that blockchain, you're in a really good position. It, it's typically a very capital intensive type of segment to get into and with significant moat as a result of that and as a result of, of various things. But if we talk about the app layer as well, of course, there's still a substantial there. I, I think exchanges are clearly 
the best app layer there. And to a degree, you can even consider them infrastructure, right? Because some of these exchanges like Binance, or I should say a lot of them are internal products, internal DeFi products within their platform. They're building, trying to kind of social networks, like you have Binance feeds, and they're really kind of taking that all around approach of trying to create a, a vast array of services for their users really becoming a bank of sorts, right? So that's extremely strong. And we've seen that confirmed in the cycle as well, where some of the DeFi companies that have had really no issues are the exchanges, the DeFi exchanges. And you even have like GMX, the, the perp exchange out and actually growing when everyone else is floundering, right? So clearly exchanges are one of the best models. And I would say a second one to that is the on-chain money markets. The lending platforms are still operating smoothly, going fairly strong. You do have the occasional attempt at an exploit, like what happened with Aave from Avi Eisenberg not long ago. But all in all, positions have been getting liquidated. People are not getting their funds frozen. They're not going out of business. And there's no type of like hidden balance sheet, hidden debt or anything like that. So uh, lending platforms are extremely effective. The big limitation with lending platforms actually is just the lack of revenue. So if we're talking about over collateralized lending platforms, they're not very capital efficient, right? So you're putting in a dollar, you're able to borrow 50 cents. It's not extremely capital efficient when you compare it to something like where you're putting in a dollar and then you're probably creating $10 type of trade, which is a lot more revenue, a lot more use for the platform itself. In the case of Alpaca, it's an interesting use case because we do under collateralized lending. So we're typically talking about 2x, 3x, which is going to be six times as capital efficient as something like Venus and and Aave and Compound, and that has served us well in maintaining uh, our revenues and our net profits to be in the green, even during this pretty nasty 2022 bear market. So under any type of capital efficiency under collateralized that can still operate on chain that doesn't require trust from third parties is still going to be a winning formula in my book. And that is one of the primary directions we're looking to continue building in Alpaca is capital efficient. DeFi products that are completely on chain. That's why we chose to do a perp exchange. We think it's a great fit for us. We have a lot of experience with this area and similar product with derivatives, with synthetic tokens, and with the liquidation system and under collateralized lending and, and really keeping that all safe. So those are really the big areas that you can say I can with a lot of confidence say are, are going to be sustainable going forward. And then of course you have like NFTs and you have NFT exchanges, which are still doing well and in, in reasonably well in this market. But of course, NFTs, it's sort of like, it's really hard to say what's going to happen with that. It's hard to say what NFTs are not going to go to zero, which ones are are going to continue to be able to attract an audience. And th that's an extremely hype-driven market, right? So the longer the long market lasts, the lower the, the prices go of the major assets, the worse an industry is going to do like NFTs when they have a big property of negative reflexivity, which means that when you see prices going down, more people actually sell. So, and that creates a negative cycle. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the state of, of DeFi. At the moment, the other big thing to talk about is L1s, right? And I think the question is, will the alt L1s survive? That's sort of what a lot of investors are putting bets on and, and thinking about. There's even new L1s coming out even during this time, right? Pete, is there anything, you have anything else to add here regarding DeFi models? If not, what are your thoughts on the alt L1s? For DeFi models, no, but I was just looking at the uh, Nexus is likely going to get burnt because they're providing coverage on Maple Pools, so they might be in the hole for like 10 million bucks. And then the the Maven pool, I think Orthogonal, which is now insolvent, makes up like 90%, which is, you know, 30 something, 32 million bucks of like the outstanding capital. So that's not looking too hot. For L1s, I think it's more of a base of, it's more about usage. So, you know, if you have Andre Crange popping back up and saying there's 30 years of runway for Phantom, but is the trust gone? And then Avalanche is sort of similar where I think a lot of the usage, like it's it's crazy to see that Wonderland now or still has the most TVL on Avalanche, which is this whole other, everybody knows the story, a whole other thing in amongst itself. So without, you know, ecosystem incentives, 
will they survive? Like, I'm sure they'll survive from like an operational capacity. And I'm sure they're doing more technical development. I know Avalanche is doing sort of like app chains or, or subnet type development, potentially for gaming. But you no, know, it's more of a question of like, where's the users going to to head or stay? And I think that's where BNB is quite interesting, where you know pancake swap volume is now I think it's higher than the new swap on ETH or kind of across the board. And you know BNB in general has sort of you know kept user numbers around the the whole sort of new Cosmos L ones like Say Network as an example, which I know VCs are quite excited for from like a valuation perspective. Always kind of scratches my head from like a usability, for, particularly these like Cosmos L ones tend to have like a a focus, let's so say like a DeFi focus or like a trading focus, which will kind of set their parameters and how the chain functions, right? But for users generally, I think it obviously you need like a very strong ecosystem. You need sort of like the the building blocks in places, which are you know dexes and money markets and leverage and so on. But you need activity and TVL to make a lot of those work, particularly money markets and as we know Alpaca you know, leverage and TVL on DEXs and liquidity and debt is a necessity to have these things. So, you know, it's hard to lay it out, say, two or three years from now when, you know, say we're in, you know, midst of a potential bull market and there's way more, you know, capital and users involved and maybe those will bleed out into like other specific chains. But for anyone entering as a new participant, you know, that's not where they're going to start, I wouldn't think. Like the ETH ecosystems, which you can kind of encompass L2s into that now. And I know if you look at Arbitrum's usage in TVL, like it's gaining some room. But also looking at what BNB's done, continues to do kind of quietly, is that there is usage, there is TVL, and there are projects building. So it's a kind of a question mark on these like, you know, these all L1s that did really well in the bull market for with ecosystem incentives to draw mercenary capital in. Can they continue as an operating entity? I'm sure they can. Will they be the the hot thing next run? It's hard to say. I think a lot of people are looking at, you know, again, gaming. NFTs kind of did the same thing. It's almost like a like an activity or, you know, volume multiple on these chains when NFTs were quite hot and I'm sure NFTs will roll from maybe PFPs into like gaming NFTs when, you know, Web3 gaming can kind of really kicks off. Yeah, it, my gut tells me that they're going to have a hard time like the Phantoms and Avalanches unless they pivot and hit a new narrative. I would expect like that the chains that have retained volume and users likely will do in a in a market. And apart from VCs being excited because it's a multiple on their entry, I have a hard time seeing because I don't do it going to a specific chain to let's say trade or to yeah let's say long short with perps i think people will stick around ecosystems that have way more going on than a very specific chain doing just one thing but sam what do you think it's really because in 2021 there were these private whale groups really orchestrating this kind of pump and dump basically on any time a new chain would come around they would go through their entire network and the chain itself would also get involved with their bd teams and and spread out capital and and marketing campaigns they would try to get that as a big event really attract retail users and that includes retail investors who didn't really understand the timing of when to sell Right. So like they're in a situation where they kind of trapped. Right. And, and that goes to the old adage that most investors, retail investors that do not have private information just end up losing side of the trade. So you had these these groups of people really like pumping up a new chain like an avalanche, for example, Solana, Polygon, et cetera, getting people to go there, invest in the project, and then they would be the first ones to sell at the top with size, right? And then after that, it was just a downhill journey completely. So it's like that. VCs were extremely involved in that as well, especially on Solana. And it seems like to be the case that some are still trying to use that strategy, but it's sort of like you're trying to use a strategy that retail is not buying into anymore because they've gotten burned by it too much. And there's not new retail users coming in that haven't aren't aware of this already. Right. So yeah, I think in a few years, the next peak of the cycle, you're going to have new investors, new users coming into these segments that you're going to see L1s potentially become big again and use this old formula. But right now, for the next couple of years, I don't think that's going to work. And these chains, they're going to be like a, a fart in the wind and they're going to make a little noise. They're going to pay media outlets and influencers to talk about them. But capital is not going to go there. The 
uh, valuations are going to drop. And I think we're already seeing that with P. What's that chain that came like a disastrous launch? Aptos. Yeah. Aptos. So we're seeing that with Aptos. I mean, what's their, like, what is their network TVL at now? Even like less than 100 million, 38 million on DeFi Llama. So it's like, yeah, we're going to say it's going to be the same. All of these are going to be the same until, unless they really provide some like crazy innovation. And it is justifiable and sound, not just reports of, of it being as fast as some other ones, right? So if we look at DeFi Llama, if we look at where is what is the TVL percentage on these various chains? So Ethereum's always been going strong. It's at 57%. And it was like back in 2020, it was pretty much like close to 100% of, of DeFi. But after BNB had its explosion, it kind of went down to like low 60s and hasn't really dropped that much since. If you're talking about this huge narrative of uh, TVL being pulled out, or new TVL entering and new tokens being created up in there to create TVL. Moving from 60s to low 60s to high 50s just really shows the, the strength of Ethereum. And it, it really looks to me like I'm sort of looking at competition between like PC companies or uh, top major software players, search engines uh, from the 1990s to the 2010s. And you see like you see ups and downs in the leader, but the leader stays consistent while the smaller players fade away. And so Ethereum's at 57%, BSC is, is still pretty strong at 13%. And one of the reasons they're strong is because of the Binance connection. As long as Binance is acquiring users, you can have some flow of users into BSC. Now, having said that, uh, Binance's strategy, there's a little bit of cannibalization there in the sense that if they see a good product on BNB chain, like lending, like savings, DeFi, they will copy it within Binance itself. So it has to be something that they can't copy. Of course, you still have a DeFi a decentralization angle with the same kind of product to use it on BNB chain within a, a DeFi scope, but it is like pretty strong for that reason. And uh, some people obviously thought FTX could do that for Solana. Well, that wasn't the case. And Solana didn't continue to suffer from that. Currently, Solana is at 0.6 percent which is not almost not worth mentioning right avalanche is at three percent polygon at two percent arbitrum surprisingly at three percent but that's sort of just an eat proxy you know optimism at one percent phantoms at one percent everything else is below one percent so it's like we're seeing these chains die out they're going to continue to die out as long as a bear market extends and continues, even a sideways market, they're going to die out because these projects that are forming the TVL on their chains are not going to be able to sustain the expenses to keep their project going, right? And new projects are never going to go for like the fifth, 10th biggest chain. They're going to go for Ethereum. They're going to go for BSC. And that funding that was provided by these other chains to build on them Avalanche, Polygon, Phantom, that was pretty much just smoke and mirrors. And they are not giving out those funds anymore. Like they weren't giving them out before, actually. Frankly, this is a lot of that was just smoke and mirrors and even false marketing where they would announce funds for hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe pay out dollars only to portfolio companies that they were invested in. And then like you didn't hear anything about it afterwards. Even in the case of Phantom, they pretty much rug pulled their entire chain they had like an on-chain promise for funding based on your tvl and then they completely just like took it back right and if this was traditional market they would have absolutely gone sued but because they're based in the bahamas because they're hidden behind a kind of structure with like a foundation and it's hard to get at them because they're dealing with DeFi companies who may not have also a regulated entity within a major market like the u.s that's the only reason that they've escaped the class action lawsuit, right? If this was a traditional market, they would be eating class action lawsuits for false marketing and the other civil laws that they basically stepped on in order to get retail investors and companies to build on their little chains. So the only one that I've actually seen pay out consistently was like Polygon because they were the first one to do it and it worked. The other ones really just like if you talk to the companies that were trying to take advantage of these programs, most of them will tell you at best got a percentage of what they should and most of the time they didn't get anything. So it's I'm pretty bearish on these alt L1s until I see something that's actually technologically going to add value. If we talk about Phantom with like Andre Crunch, he's not going to do anything from the start. Phantom is, there are two aspects of if you study the fundamentals of a chain. One is, are they improving technologically? Are they technologically sustainable in terms of like what every other chain improving in some way, even if you consider Ethereum sort of like legacy software? 
are these other chains adding value? Are they doing something better? And if you look at Anthem's development, like their development history, they're pretty much doing almost nothing in terms of optimizing or improving the fundamentals of their chain. They spend all of their resources on marketing and on improving the app layer, like making it better for DeFi companies to build on them, but not for actual, like making faster transactions, more robust security, like completely just like lack of GitHub commits when you compare it to other chains, right? And Avalanche also like still has major issues like, okay, you have subnets, great, but the subnets do not inherit the security of the main chain. So like you're asking, and this is also my issue with Polkadot. It's like, you're asking a little bit too much of the app. That's like the fundamental problem there. You're asking the apps to kind of like be hardware companies, like to basically run their own chain and the security on it. It's like, think about it. It's sort of like if you were at McDonald's and you were expecting your clients to know how to flip hamburgers and like make their own food, right? So like you're turning it not even into a buffet, you're making them actually prepare the meals to eat at your restaurant. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's like no one really thought about this. It's kind of weird. But that is the issue with some of these. It's like, okay, so now I, I want to build on Avalanche or subnets. I have to hire a security, like a security team to be able to, to do that and also to be able to enforce and have a consistent policy. It's just like, yeah, it's very weird. But BNB chain, Ethereum still going strong. So, you know, that's always going to be a good thing for the market. So I think that's quite enough about companies and infrastructure. I think we can end this call with a discussion of like the more savory type of clickbait news within our industry, at least, which is the big thing that's been talked about a lot on crypto Twitter, even mainstream media is will we see justice for 2022's big blowups and villains? So SBF, Suzu, Doquan, what do you think is going to happen, Pete? Yeah, it's really difficult. The one thing to keep in mind is this always takes way longer than, than everybody wants to. Like the SPF is a complete different. That's a complete different animal. In particular, like the, the media rounds he's been doing and the mainstream media spin trying to kind of move him away from someone who lost billions and billions of dollars. That is a tiny bit separate when looking at like a Suzu, but Suzu or Doquan, but they're still working, right? Like, which is, I find a bit crazy. So like, there's rumors that Suzu's opening is raising for a new fund. You know, there's like continual attempts of like Doquan, like providing Terra networks, but like a lot of these prosecutors don't seem to have much of a leg to, to stand on, right? Where one of the core TFL members, you know, they was arrested and then let go by South Korean prosecutors no more than a couple of days ago. It seems like no, to be honest, at this point, albeit like we talked about a while ago, like that Ian Bellina guy from the ICO days who, you know, finally got sort of arrested and fined for all of his pump and dumps throughout that years. And that's years and years later, it's five years later. But these are an anomaly, particularly SBF, that there's a lot of different things and different pulleys in, in the background happening. If you happen to be in Dubai, if you were regulated of a country or not regulated at all that didn't have American oversight, they likely don't have the resources nor the want to really go after you in a country and they, that they fundamentally can't. You know, with you know Kyle from 3AC kind of sitting in Indonesia, with, that's not going to happen either. And it's probably not even worth their time. But all this kind of rolls into is you know, from what I see is just a lot of governments using this as a reason to have sweeping regulation around a I think it's around retail involvement. So we're going to allow people to maybe even off board some of this crypto. And if we do, we're going to tax shit of them. I think everyone's moving towards some form of like either short term, long term, or just like blanket taxes, kind of 20, 30, 40% taxes on these assets. I think the biggest farce in it all is, you know, any form of consumer protection. And that we know that's kind of not the case. But I don't see it happening, albeit sometimes these legal matters take a long time to form to build a case around properly. And also like the founders of these firms to slip up, to go to the wrong country or do the wrong thing, to finally sort of, you know, clamp down. But the, the SBF thing is a complete other anomaly, the way they're trying to basically spin this and the way the media has been bought, that it was just sort of a kid that had an oopsie and, and lost everybody's money. But considering the capital that he took and the people behind it, that I wouldn't expect that nothing happens, but I wouldn't be overtly surprised if all just goes away. Like there's been polls across TT where it's like, well, if you know, Suzy open a new fund, like who would you invest into? Like a Susu's new fund, SBF's new venture, whatever. And 
a lot of people because they weren't like directly affected because they didn't invest in in 3AC, even though they probably got wrecked in, in Terra or UST, tend to forget. We have a very, very short memory in the space. So it's not going to happen this year, obviously kind of coming to the end of year. But I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of these just get swept under the rug and and everyone forgets. So if you have a huge cohort of people that gets you know pushed out of the market and fresh new people come in, they likely aren't following these cases or were affected by them. Therefore, they don't really care. And the, this is just basically open the door for countries around the world and regulators to either tax it or like really restrict you know retail involvement, which is probably like the biggest net negative of all of this. The reality is that almost every government in the world, and even to a lesser degree, the U.S., if they want to put you behind bars, they can find a dozen reasons to do so, right? They can create a new law. They can find loopholes, especially if you are a person that is operating within an unregulated industry like crypto and DeFi. Just look at what happened to Arthur Hayes, right? So if you're operating in an unregulated industry, you're likely not keeping like super tight books. You don't have a, a compliance officer that's following like uh, the thousand rules that are necessary to do that within the US and the EU. And that was reinforced by the guy who came in to take over FTX's books and basically said like, this is a complete disaster. And you know, any one of those could be a reason to put you away. So the reality is that you can be put away. And if they're not putting them away, like someone like SBF specifically, because he is still close to the US. If they're not putting him away, it's because they don't want to. And, you know, like Elon Musk said that although he announced that he provided $40 million, the second biggest donor to the Democratic Party, that like it's closer to a billion dollars <laughs> in reality. So it's like, so the big issue there is if you're a politician who took money from this or even an organization that took money from this, that can be clawed back if this was labeled as fraud. So imagine if you got $10 million, what are you going to do, right? Assuming you operate a moral gray area at best because you're in politics, right? So like in the first place, if you're in politics, you're probably not going to be a, a stand-up individual who's, you know, like not able to flexibly uh, play around moral guidelines. So a big thing that we're seeing is even if you consider just being like 40, 60 million that's a, a lot of money, like six figures, seven figures to a lot of these politicians. And that is what we're seeing with SBF. Will he be put to justice? I really don't think it's a matter of like not being able to put a case together. The, the case is pretty open and shut in his case. It is a complete matter of it's just corruption. I think people are seeing the extent of the corruption, but that doesn't mean that anything is going to change. There have been a lot of countries in the world where corruption has been obvious for decades, if not 100 years, and it just continues. And only now that you have like internet media, that you have some the ability to be able to follow the news instead of just eat what the news throws at you through newspapers and, and news channels are people starting kind of like have the ability to be aware of this, but they don't have the ability to do anything about it. And the ability to be aware, really, the only thing you can do is completely go all in and, and launch a, a revolution. Typically, if it's not in the army doing that, then you have no chance as people, right? Think back to Occupy Wall Street, right? <laughs> like whatever happened with that, nothing. And, and we're seeing anytime you have this type of outrage, it is just PR. Until guns are picked up, there's nothing you can really do to, to change this kind of system. And it's kind of sickening to look at, but this is how things go. And the difference between SBF, is it's outright corruption that you can see. And, and the stuff with Do Kwan and Do Kwan Associates is more like they're just in hiding. And like you said, Pete, that it's a lot more difficult. The cost of bringing them to justice is higher because no one knows where they are. The local governments that probably they would choose a location to go to that was not have agreements with the country that they were indicted in to extradite them. And that's just going to be much more difficult to do so. If they do, even if they did get extradited, it would take years or at best to do so. So that's the situation with Suzu and Kyle Davies. Do Kwan, you know, he kind of disappeared. And then his associates, it's really hard to say what locally speaking, South Korea has a lot of corruption as well. And they're not in the headlights like Do Kwan is. They have lots of ways to escape prosecution. So yeah, that's the, the reality. It's sort of like the governments are going to ignore the culpable individuals and they're just going to go after the completely 
unresponsible parties that they get the biggest benefit from regulating, which is DeFi. DeFi pretty much had nothing to do with any of this, right? Maybe with the exception of, of Terra, but you know that's just kind of the, the reality that we live in. So anyways, I think at this point, we'll take some Q&A. If anyone has any questions about anything we've discussed, anything Alpaca related, just press the request button at the bottom left of your app and we will take your question. Okay, we're going to take a question from our Ask Alpaca Bank. So the first question is, does Alpaca plan for any sort of funding from Binance, especially since we are one of the biggest projects on the BNB chain? Is that even possible? So Alpaca was a fair launch. We don't really have tokens that we can sell to Binance. Technically, we can, or to any type of investor, we can technically sell some part of the war chest funds, but then we, you know, there's not that much of them. So we don't have like that kind of strategic reserve to be able to do that. And also, I think operationally, we prefer being a decentralized organization and not having to answer to like the big bosses like that. Once you bring in investors with our type of structure where it's like incorporated equity company running the platform, like if you sell equity, then you need a board of directors. Then like, you know, you have to have like oversight and take and incorporate these stakeholders, like it's hard to know what really their interests are outside of profit, but it's not going to be the interest of doing the right thing and the best thing for the users and for the stakeholders in the platform, which is currently the principle that we operate by. So I think within Alpaca, we don't plan to do that. And we're pretty happy with how things have been going. So all right, we'll take probably two more questions here from the Ask Alpaca Bank. Yeah, so this is a question that some people have been asking about both internally and in our chats about the AVs. The question is from the BNB AV chart, automated vaults. It appears that recent volatility did not trigger the repurchasing mechanism as expected. Could you explain why and elaborate on how the repurchasing algorithm operates? Uh, also, there were some questions about why there were failed TXs on some repurchases in the past. So the question about failed TXs is essentially that it works like the hedging operation has limiters similar to slippage, like max slippage setting. And the TX is going to revert any time that the conditions change from when the transaction was submitted to when it would actually execute and be added to the blockchain. So you're going to see that from time to time, especially when price is moving. So when price is moving, it's going to have high volatility. Maybe the repurchasing algorithm no longer wants to repurchase at the price that it gets after submitting the TX. So you might see a series of failed TXs. That's pretty normal for an automated system like this. As for the volatility or rather the timing, the repurchase decisions. So that has to do with the second hedging layer. Essentially, you have the repurchasing layer, which is like pretty clear how that works. The repurchase is like buys a, a cheaper price and does the transaction rather than selling it on the market at a higher fee. As far as the hedging layer, that has some more advanced logic behind it. And we'll be publishing more information about that, that we are putting together with the hedging team to be able to best answer how that works exactly. But essentially, if I had to summarize the answer to the question, it makes the decision to repurchase when it believes it will be most net profitable over the long term. So if it's not repurchasing, it's because it's more profitable to do it later or to wait until prices revert if it is repurchasing because it thinks it's the best time to do so. So that's what we'll share for now. And as I said, we will give a more detailed answer specifically on AVs and the repurchasing and, and hedging logic, hopefully this week, possibly next week. Okay, last question is going to be about GMX. What do you think is the reason for GMX's dominance in the perp contract space? And what could Alpaca learn for its upcoming platform? Yeah, so our perp exchange has a lot of similarities with GMX. I think there's a few reasons that people really like it. By the way, it's not just GMX, like DYDX does pretty well. DYDX is actually the leader in a perp exchanges, but the reason people like GMX and that it's grown so fast in a relatively short period of time is for a few reasons. One, it's, it's decentralized, right? So you don't have to send your money to FTX and then have it disappear to use its uh, per products. GMX is on chain. That's obviously a, a big plus now. The second is that you have no slippage trades. So you can put in a trade with huge size. It's going to execute at the exact price you want it. That's a very nice thing if you're to make a market order at the current price, right? So 
the other thing is like just the liquidity available as a function of how the liquidity provision works, which actually enables the no slippage thing. So like the GLP pool over there, you basically put the funds in, you have some exposure and you're like the market maker to the platform. The way that they tied that into GLP rewards and revenues and it's been like making money from even from the counter trading angle, it's obviously been effective in attracting capital. And the more capital that there is there, the more capital that exists to for traders to utilize for their trades. So overall, it's just a, a more efficient system. Of course, there are some issues that we're looking to fix in our perp exchange, but people really like GMX. The marketing's been effective, you know, so overall, it's just a, they've done a great job there. All right. So that's going to be it for today's Fireside Chat. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you missed any part of this, it will be available not too long after we end the spaces on Twitter. And then in a few days, we'll also put it up on Spotify and on YouTube. And you'll be able to listen to it there as well as all of our prior Fireside Chats, which have been have not been short of interesting events to discuss as of lately. So again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Pete, and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam.